Welcome to the Wild Physio Podcast with your host, Andrew Wild. Today, I welcome back Dr. Tom Cross, who featured on the Dr. Merv Cross podcast episodes last year. We touched on the cross bracing protocol last time Tom featured, but today we can finally talk in detail about Tom's pioneering research. Tom has practiced sports medicine since 1997, and he has a broad sports medicine experience caring for recreational athletes, musculoskeletal injuries that occur at work or home, and elite professional athletes and also military personnel. As mentioned today, we will be discussing the revolutionary cross-bracing protocol for ruptured ACL injuries. This protocol was pioneered by Tom and his father, Dr. Merv Cross, and it has yielded research that was published last week, finally, in the British Journal of Sports Medicine. Dr. Cross has been a huge influence on my career, and I can't thank him enough for his ongoing support. A huge welcome to Dr. Tom Cross. Thanks very much, Andrew. It's Thanks for coming on, mate. Thanks, thanks for your time. No worries. It's been a long time coming. Obviously, we talked about it last year on the podcast with Merv. Finally, it's been published. So congratulations. Thanks so much. Appreciate it. First question people probably want to know is, what is the cross-bracing protocol and how did it come about? Sure. Um, well, it started nine years ago um, here at the Stadium Clinic in Sydney. And there was a 19-year-old netballer who had injured her ACL and she was in the clinic and um, she, she did, did not want surgery and she was quite um, obviously very upset. It was one day after her injury and fortuitously my father who um, was retired at the time was in stadium physio rehabilitating his bilateral knee replacement ironically and Merv got involved in the consultation with Emma um, so these patients we're going to talk about today, um, they don't mind us talking. We've ha we have their consent. Um, so Emma, myself, and my father Merv um, brainstormed her options of you know, rehabilitation alone, uh, ACL re reconstructive surgery. And Merv said, well, back in the 70s, we used to put people in plaster and bend their knee and try to make them stiff. These are the patients who either were not eligible for surgery or didn't want surgery. And some of them got better and others didn't. They didn't know why in the 70s because they didn't have MRI, et cetera. Um, so it, was, it was about making the capsule tight, et cetera. Anyway, she said, Emma said, I'll give this a go. What have I got to lose? I can always get surgery if it doesn't work. And so Emma pioneered the treatment. It was Merv's idea to go to 90. I, I would have never come up with it. Um, but we discussed it and we made sure Emma was safe and we looked after her through the whole protocol from beginning to end. But the, the hallmarks of this treatment are to take the knee into flexion, which is essentially a closed reduction of the injured ACL tissues, and then to hold that, uh, to, to maintain that reduction by holding the knee at 90 for four weeks. That's, that's the absolute principle of the treatment, closed reduction of injured ACL tissue then holding it there, allowing it to hopefully heal in the middle of the knee and then gradually bringing the, the knee out straight incrementally every week thereafter, week five, six, seven, uh, eventually to the 12th week. Um, so from, from Emma in 2014, in the next five years, we had four people come into the clinic uh, that were either, well, Emma was part of the clinic. She was the daughter of uh, Julie, who was one of our most valued receptionists well they're all valued and then we had um, a colleague of mine injure his ACL um, I had a friend's son and then Merv had a friend's son and then my nephew so Merv's grandson was patient five so that was in the next five years four people chose to adopt this you know, essentially cr crazy idea of going to 90 degrees and going non-weight bearing on crutches and we got very lucky because we we healed all five of them um, and then in 2019, in April, there was a 16-year-old, very talented rugby player, uh, Toby, who um, also said, I don't want surgery. Um, he had a strong family history of ACL injuries. Brother and mum had had reconstructions, and unfortunately, they needed a revision. Um, so he wasn't really enamored with surgery. And he said, is there another way? And I said, well, five people have done this bending the knee into 90 and embracing the knee. And, and uh, these are the hypotheses, hypotheses behind it, Toby. Uh, and I went through them, which we can go through to today, why we think it encourages or facilitates healing. 
And then, so he was patient six and he chose it. He also, has, we did the maths on getting him back for rugby the next year. He wanted to play in the first. We had time that if it didn't work, we could always go to surgery. Um, so we, Toby's mum and dad, myself and Toby were all signed up to this um, possible outcome of failure, but also the very alluring outcome of healing the ACL and avoiding surgery and essentially giving the patient back their knee. And fortunately, Toby made a full recovery. He got a very good heal and he really triggered the research. And that was four years ago. And in, then in clinical practice, every patient that I saw with an ACL, I had a very long discussion of rehabilitation alone. We're choosing another non-surgical treatment, which is this novel idea of bending the knee into 90 degrees to adequately reduce the injured tissues and then taking them on this journey through a bracing protocol. And then I also, also equally talked about ACL reconstructive surgery with these patients. So we call that, as you know, a shared decision-making model that the get to know the patient, what are their, what's their situation, what are their needs, what sports and activities they want to get back to, et cetera. Um, do they have the option of surgery? Do they have health insurance? Can, could they possibly pay for their surgery? So from that moment on in April 2019, with Toby triggering the research, um, we've now gathered 269 patients um, in this case series. And 38 of them are in New Zealand. With Dr. Ra Jury, a close friend and colleague, has um, braced the vast majority of those patients. And then most are in New South Wales, but there's some scattered all around Australia. And then there's a few international patients that have adopted it. So that's the that's the cross bracing protocol um, named in honor of Merv, who who had the uh, the the original idea to to enact this treatment. Yeah. So some of the listeners aren't in the medical field. So I think we should dive into what the ACL is, how it's injured and how it's traditionally treated. Sure. So the ACL is, is in your knee for a reason. It's, it's, the, it's a fundamental, very important uh, ligament that controls anterolateral rotatory stability, um, but it also in, it controls um, anterior, posterior translation of the knee. Um, we, it's there for a reason. And when it's not there, um, people who are athletic, who start sidestep, pivot, jump, land, um, re really do most of the time notice that, that, that uh, they're ACL deficient. So you really need an ACL to sidestep, pivot, jump and land safely. Otherwise, the knee can give way where the thigh bone or femur um, subluxes or gives way and loses position on the shin bone or tibia um, so in an ideal world um, you'd like to have one and you'd like to either heal it or go to a very good surgeon um, and get it reconstructed or repaired um, what's interesting is i think athletes have been rupturing their acls for thousands of years you know the, the male and female warriors who went out and fought or went hunting and jumped over rocks and ledges and ruptured their acl and it's only in the last 50 years with modern medicine that we've had the ability to offer the surgery in the late seventies and eighties. And, um, you know, Merv was one of the pioneering surgeons here in Australia and indeed around the world who, who pioneered firstly open ACL reconstructive surgery and then arthroscopic and et cetera. So it's, it's to go full circle in his career from pioneering the surgery into taking a complete 180 paradigm shift and thinking let's let's try a non-surgical treatment of of bracing the knee it's quite quite extraordinary and how is an acl typically injured well in the 369 patients that i've seen and, 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 and co-managed with ra jury over in new zealand um the top it, the most common mechanism is non-contact so running at speed and pivoting and changing direction so it's an uncoordinated sidestep where the athletes often um, distracted they're looking at what's what's coming next or that they're, they're watching the players that might be that they're trying to defend against or they're trying to attack um, and or it's an uncoordinated jump landing and then 
the the foot's planted on the ground and the femur rotates on the planted tibia. And then that torque or what could be a valgus moment, which is an opening up of the knee, exceeds the tensile strength of the ACL and it ruptures. Um, so most commonly non-contact, that can be contact where they where they collide into either their own player or an, or an opponent. Um, and then we've got the skiing injuries that, 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 you know, was the human being meant to put a boot on with a big ski? And I love skiing, but it's a very good, if you catch an edge or you don't get your landing right, you, you can easily exceed the tensile strength of that ACL. So the the sports that mainly we see are probably in order, skiing, soccer, netball, uh, AFL, um, touch football, Oz tag, um, martial arts, jiu-jitsu. Yeah. Um, and then there's you know basketball, anything where the athlete's generating a lot of power and speed and jumping and landing, pivoting. And traditionally in Australia, there has been, with an ACL injury, a push to go for early surgery or surgery. And uh, some of the statistics are up to 97% of people that have done their ACL will go in for surgery. And But in a lot of European countries, it's about 50%. So why do you think there has been a high rate of surgical intervention in Australia comparatively to the European nations? Um, I think what was realized for doctors and physios and allied health in the infancy of sports medicine, you know, over the last hundred years is that, you know, the ACL deficient patients in the athletes in the forties, fifties, sixties, and seventies, it often was career ending. So they would rupture their ACL and at the peak of their power was in their, you know, the, the female athletes in her early twenties and, and, she never really can make it back. And then every time she has a major giving way episode, trying to get back, she does more damage to her knee, you know, articular cartilage, meniscal. So, and I think Australia is a very sporty country. We love sport. Um, and so probably the athletes led the way that, and, and the surgeons, like, you know, my father, arguing I'm biased, but Merv was, one of the main pioneers in the 70s and 80s, he went over to America and learned ACL surgery, researched it in the Houston clinic with Jack Houston and brought those that knowledge back. And then there was lots of very good doctors here in Australia or in all capital cities pioneering surgery. And the aim was to stabilize the knee, to stop these significant recurrent giving way episodes that led to significant damage to the knee and, and early osteoarthritis. So you, the surgeons which were rightly so trying to protect the knee from further instability and enable athletes to go back to sport. And I think the everyone's watching the general community um, that ACL injury equals early ACL reconstructive surgery to get to be enabled to go back to normal activities in sport. Um, so I think that's why, and also we're you know we are we do have very, very good sports medicine orthopedics in this country you know with doctors physios the whole allied health team and everyone had the same same goal of enabling athletes um, we do have private health insurance and then people who don't have private health insurance often choose to have the reconstruction and um, pay pay the money or to get a loan um the europeans that you know they they their public health authorities and epidemiologists have looked at um, you know, the whole community and said, said if you if you're a if you're a weekend warrior recreational athlete you go down rehab alone first and then see if you cross over see is can you functionally stabilize your knee with really good rehab um, and cross over in the months ahead if your knee is unstable it doesn't feel quite right if you have symptoms. But I'm sure that all the the elite athletes in Europe go straight to surgery. Um, yeah, I think that's the history of the of the last fifty years. Now, a lot of my listeners know that I often do quick fire questions where I ask the guest multiple questions and they have to answer with a yes, no, or maybe. So we're going to do a a few of them and yeah, then we sure. may discuss these. 
and then we'll do another block and then go from there because people probably want a definitive yes or no or even a maybe and then d dive into why. So we'll go through, I think there's about seven or six or so. So let's dive into these. The first one, do we still need highly skilled orthopedic surgeons to perform ACL reconstructive surgery for some, but not all ACL ruptures? Absolutely. So the, in our research, the last four years, and you know, we only have one publication, it was done in private practice and there's arguably many uh, methodological flaws in et cetera, but it's, it, it's a, um, it's an introduction to this notion of ACL healing and that like all injuries, you know, fractures, lacerations, uh, all soft tissue injuries, there's a spectrum of injury from uh, a, a ruptured ACL that's got minimal separation between the stumps with no tissue you know, displaced out of the intercondylar notch right to a profoundly injured ACL where there's a distance between the ruptured tissues of 1.5 centimetres and 60% and of the ACLs ended up under the lateral femoral condyle. So, you know, I've looked at about 800 MRIs in the last four years and expert opinion, level four evidence-based medicine is that approximately 50 to 60% of the, the ACLs still need a very good elite surgeon we believe that we don't we can't heal them adequately for a young woman or man to go back to these sports that really demand an ACL, you know, such as the ones I talked about earlier with that injure the ACL. So they they are very needed. It's a, the, the message today is, you know, one of collaboration that um, knee surgeons are absolutely needed. Um, we love surgeons. Uh, I've had plenty of surgery uh, myself. Um, well, but we're introducing another uh, another way or another option for a patient of um so it's a non-surgical option you've got rehab alone which is just doing physio and getting doing very good functional rehabilitation as you know andrew and and then this idea of facilitating the healing so 50 percent surgery approximately yeah now let's go through one We'll go through about six questions. Just go a yes, no, or maybe for all of them, and then we'll go back to them. So we'll go first one. Do too many people have ACL surgery for ACL ruptures? Yes, I'm afraid. Can some completely ruptured ACLs heal without surgery? Absolutely. Can some completely ruptured ACLs heal without surgery and without using a bracing protocol? It, it probably five to ten percent. Okay. That right up the spectrum of, um, we we say minimally injured because of the, the spectrum of injury, and then provided that patient um, has pain and holds their knee in flexion, so that that we call that nature's brace. Nature is telling the yep. patient to bend their knee, and then they often stay home and work on their computer, and and they're in the seated position, healing at ninety. Um, the patient who walks around and gets told to straighten their leg out and um, doesn't have a lot of pain, even with a minimally injured, they often don't heal. So the, the stumps involute and they're just looking at each other millimeters apart. Mm. Uh, so that you have to have this right formula of a less injured ACL and the patient um, sitting down all day in, with their knee bent, not a brace on. That's and, my experience. And in the past, in emergency, often they'd put people in a zimmer splint when they and that's complete opposite of what they should do <laughs> sure i mean there's a saying you don't know what you don't know and yeah exactly they're, they're trying to do the right thing of yeah um stabilizing the knee um, helping with analgesia but it's actually from this research the exact opposite of what you want to do that you're holding that acl apart that desperately wants to be united with its fellow ruptured tissue on the other side um so that's happening right now in emergency departments and that we hope that our research is is adopted and accepted and that knowledge disseminates into the emergency departments, particularly uh, pediatric hospitals. Yes. Uh, the, the kids, um, they get put in a Zimmer splint and the doctors and nurses and physios are well-meaning. And as I said, but but it's actually the opposite of what nature wants, which is to... Um, 
bend the knee and ap- approximate the tissue. Yeah. This one's an easy one. Can some completely ruptured ACLs heal using the cross bracing protocol? Yeah, of course. But once course. again, based on the what the MRI looks like. Yeah. But there are certain profoundly injured ACLs that we just talked about that the cross bracing protocol can get some healing, but not very meaningful healing. Yeah. We can talk about that further, but yeah, uh, I've got, I've got some questions about the classification system in a second. Yeah, sure. If an ACL rupture is going to heal spontaneously, would that person achieve a more optimal healing response and outcome if they use the cross bracing protocol? Um, Yes. The answer is yes. Um, So we, we feel that the ACL is injured on a spectrum. If you say, if you look from left to right, you know, the minimally injured, moderately injured, and some profoundly injured ACLs, just mm-hmm. like fractures. And and some of the fractures don't need a great deal of splinting. Um, some fractures need a closed reduction, and some fractures need an open reduction internal fixation. So the that spectrum of, of injury to the ACL, if you do rehab alone, it'll drop down into its um, healing uh, spectrum. So the severely injured ones and the moderately usually don't heal very well at all. Um, whereas if it's minimally injured, it drops into full healing or okay healing, which is another topic, which is um, how it heals and how thick the ligament is. Is it con- contiguous or continuous? It hasn't got a sag in it. Is it lengthened? Is there any thinning in the ligament at any, in, in any zone? Um, but if you put the brace on, we feel that the, healings shifted towards better healing so you enhance the healing so the moderately injured acl can get full anatomical healing the severely injured acl will will probably get a reduced thickness heal with elongation or a sag or some of them no healing at all because they're so badly injured and you can't reduce any of the tissue in the brace yeah and when it comes to the cross bracing protocol, so a severely injured ACL won't spontaneously heal. No, yeah, it can't. So some principles yeah. of anatomy and reduction. Yeah, but a minimally or moderately injured ACL may spontaneously heal. Exactly. Yeah. So, but provided the patient keeps their knee in some degree of flexion, we believe from our experience. Yeah. Um, this is a big question. So do we know, obviously this research doesn't have 20 or 30 years worth of research behind it, but do we know if the cross-bracing protocol has a reduced incidence of re-rupture rate compared to ACL reconstruction? The answer to that would be we don't know yet. I think yep. we need to watch this space. Um, we've come up with a nomenclature for um, looking at the MRIs acutely and then looking at them at 12 weeks and you know, nine to 12 months follow-up. And you know, we we term the area where the ACL fails the rupture zone. And then what you see at 12 weeks and nine or 12 months MRI is called the healing zone. Um, and we don't know yet that when that healing zone reaches its peak tensile strength. Um, we also don't know, and, and the, the critics of this treatment would say, you know, that that might be inherently weak, the healing zone, that compared to their other uninjured ACL we don't know that yet, but the failure rate or crossing over to surgery rate so far, uh, it was 11% in the first 80 patients. Uh, we now have 310 patients that have followed up to um, the 12 week MRI or when um, we have a, sorry, 160 that are 12 months followed up to nine years. And the crossover rate is the same, 11%. So, and we either cross them over to surgery at the 12 week mark, if they've had um, inadequate healing. So we've, they've, we've braced a severely injured ACL. Now we do it knowingly and the patient knows they've got one. Mm-hmm. Um, or it was these patients in the infancy of the research you know, three, four years ago before we developed the MRI classification system, um, brace, we braced a severely injured ACL before we develop the um, MRI classification system. So it's, a, it's roughly 11% crossover. Surgery in with the elite surgeons re- and the patient wanting to return to these high demand sports, it's r- roughly 15. 
Um, but we need more data. We've, we've yep. got 160 at 12 months to nine years follow up. It'll be great when we get you know the 370 patients out to five years, and and then really really interesting the 10 year data of do they get osteoarthritis? Uh, what's the failure rate? Survivorship of the healed ACL? This this is all ahead. And you're currently working hard to write, submit, and publish a paper about the MRI classification system for ACL injuries. Is that correct? Definitely. Yeah. Yep. So it, it dovetails um, the research. And it's really in interesting that, you know, our first author, Stephanie Philbay, who I thank dearly for the for the work, um, her and her team in the Canoon trial showed that the ACL can heal spontaneously. And then... I, I was introduced to Stephanie three years ago through another author on the paper, Jane Rooney, the phys leading physio in Melbourne. And that set up the collaboration between University of Melbourne and us here in the in Sydney. Um, and that led to the paper one, which is what's been published, uh, which are the hypotheses behind the treatment and the results so far. Um, obviously with all the scientists and doctors listening, it, it's, it's, it's not, you know, a randomized control trial. We don't have blinded examiners. We don't have blinded radiologists. We're, we're doing this treatment within the best interests of every patient coming into the clinic with this new novel treatment and the patients consent to it after a very long consultation. Um, paper two is what we learned in, the, in, in these last four years of really analyzing the MRIs and looking for um, the degree of displacement. So if you use orthopedic nomenclature, just like fractures, well, how displaced is that ACL? If we know that bending the knee into 90 achieves um, on average four to six millimeters of reduction. So that point where the ACL attaches on the femur, the thigh bone is brought as the crow flies four to six millimeters closer to the tibial insertion. So if you think of the ACL in that conduit, it gets approximated by four to six millimeters. So we come up with this term, the gap distance. What's the separation between the ACL? Um, and we measure that broadly on the MRI because there's different gap distances. If it depends where you put your caliper on the MRI. And we get an average. And then we talk, talk about how much tissue is thrown out of the notch. You know, as that you think about the violence of the injury, the femur is rotating violently like a rope. It throws ACL tissue forward or anteriorly and laterally as the femur rotates. So it always ends up either anterior or under the lateral femoral condyle in the lateral compartment or both. Um, so that 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 idea of looking for how injured is the ACL and how displaced it is. And can we reduce it is the fundamental principle behind um, this tr this new treatment. And when it comes to managing an acute ACL, ACL injury, say, for instance, myself, physio, you're on the sideline, you see someone go down, you're suspecting an ACL injury, how would you go about it? And it's somewhat ironic, the fact that we're talking about this after what happened yesterday. I was at a game of football covering it. And one of my boys went down with a suspected ACL injury and he's seeing you today at midday. So how does one go about managing it? Yeah, well, this is also controversial, what I'm about to say, because it is it is a paradigm shift. And I've been in sports medicine, like you said, since 97. And I've seen and managed dozens of ACLs pitch side on, on the field of play in, in recreational and professional athletes. Um, and also, I've also seen patients in the clinic um, for, for 26 years with ruptured ACLs. So the caveat to what I'm about to say is based on this research and this knowledge of ACL injury and knowledge of, um, it really depends on how injured the ACL is in terms of displacement of tissue, separation of tissue, whether you've got a chance of reducing the tissue and uniting the, the epiligament of the ligament and bringing it together. So what I would do or advise if, if, if a physio uh, clinician, orthopedic surgeon is on the sideline um, and, a, and a male or female athlete 
uh, hopefully you witness the injury. So you're watching all the time the, the, the play. Um, or you've got vision, you've got the ability to look at vision of the injury. That's number one, to see the injury happen. And you, often you can diagnose it from just the mechanism. Two is to nominate someone on the sideline to examine the knee. Because uh, you have to make a decision pit side to send the athlete back out on the field of play or not, which is a critically important decision. Um, you do a very gentle Lockman um, to look at the integrity of the ACL. You wouldn't do a pivot shift because I'm worried about causing more harm to the knee or the ACL and turning a, you know, a moderately injured ACL into a profoundly injured by separating the tissue more by examining them. Um, you obviously do the history before you examine. So did your knee give way? Did you feel a shift? Uh, did you hear or feel a pop or, or a number of pops or, or snaps, cracks? Um, have you had an ACL injury before? Look at their other knee. Is there a family history? You know, are you hypermobile? You're doing all these questions in quick fire. So when you determine that it is an injured ACL, obviously the athlete should not go back on the field of play. Some of them do. They, there's all the big range of um, responses to ACL injury from I want to keep playing um, to uh, you know, I'm in severe agony and you get stretched off. We think that that's got to do with the spectrum of injury and the violence. You know, is there a big bone bruise um, that might be associated with more pain? Uh, is there uh, concomitant injuries to the knee? And, th and this is a whole other discussion of is the injured injured ACL spectrum proportionate to the degree of newtons of energy enacted on the knee? Um, so that that athlete, then I would advise put a brace on thirty to ninety and make them non weight bearing on crutches. Once again, protecting the ruptured ACL from further injury. So don't give them any infl inflammatories because that's that's taking away the inflammation response that we want um, you can ice the knee but um, for pain relief i don't think that's going to harm the, the potential outcome of the acl healing and then um, get the patient to a very good mri facility as quickly as possible you know in the next 48 hours to diagnose get an mri diagnosis and then um, so then you want the mri to be done to be done at a very good imaging facility that will run at, all the knee sequences, hopefully with at least three millimeter cuts. Some MRI facilities do four millimeter cuts, which just aren't good enough to see the ACL properly and to classify it properly. Um, we like three or even 2.5 millimeter cuts. And we love an extra sequence called the double oblique, where you can see the ACL in its full glory, where they turn the gantry of the MRI on its side and you you can see the oblique ligament through the notch. Um, and then we classify the MRI into the different types of ACL injuries that we've that will be described in paper two. And then you can go back to the injured athlete and their partner or their parents if, and have a meaningful discussion about you know, what do you want to do? You, you obviously, if they're an athlete, they want to go back to sport. Um, if they're a recreational athlete, they're a little bit older, they may not want to, they may want to say retire from uh, these sports that hurt the ACL. Um, so and then you talk about rehab alone and this new idea of cross bracing protocol and uh, ACL reconstructive surgery. Um, and then you've been talking in a meaningful way about the pros and cons of each treatment based on their, um, how injured their ACL is. And also the, don't forget the concomitant injuries do they have a ruptured MCL that needs to be braced anyway? Do they have a bucket handle meniscal tear that we ethically would never brace? Ne needs to go to an expert knee surgeon. So there's lots of considerations. You know, is the postlateral corner lateral ligament complex badly injured? Um, so and when it's it comes complicated, but it's simple. When it comes to the brace, is there a latest day post injury that you can brace? Yeah, this is a really interesting finding from the research is that like that athlete we just talked about, all the hopefully this young guy today doesn't have an ACL, um, but say he does, um, we're seeing him, thanks to you, within 24 hours. Um, 
And the the treatment for him would be if he does have an ACL to talk to him and his parents. He's only seventeen. Mm -hmm. uh, about these three options: rehab alone, cross bracing protocol, surgery. Um, usually, the seventeen year old who's a very good athlete is never going to you know, go and do Pilates and yoga and cycle like someone my age. Um, that they want to compete, um, so they they're, they're going to look at you know cross bracing if they're a good candidate and they can achieve you know, anatomical healing or full healing or go to an elite knee surgeon. Um, if, the, if they are a good candidate for this new treatment of um, re reducing the tissue by bending the knee, um, we like to go to 90 day four to seven. So because if you take them, if I took him to 90 today, we're compelled to anticoagulate him so he doesn't get a blood clot, a DVT. And if we start the anticoagulation today, tonight, um, his knee, you've got to think of the ACL, it's a its a fresh wound and those stumps are bleeding. They've got, it's got a great blood supply. If you give them an anticoagulant, they'll bleed more and he'll get a, more swelling in his knee tonight and overnight. So we, we just take him 30 to 90, tell him to spend most of his time at 90. So I'd say go home and study, read a book, um, but try to keep your knee at 90 because you're approximating your tissue. Um, try to sleep with your knees bent because um, you're once again approximating your ACL. Don't straighten your leg out. Um, so try to keep at least 30 degrees of flexion and the brace will help that. And then get, get him, talking about the patient yesterday that got injured, the AFL player. Um, we brace him day four to day seven and then start the anticoagulation, take him to 90. It's, it's too late. Um, after 20 to 21 days. So there's, there's, a, there's a phenomenon called involution where in every tissue, and if it's not united with its fellow tissue, would you leave a gaping wound open on your skin? You, the answer is no. You, you bring the tissue together with steri strips or sutures. Would you leave a fracture unreduced? Um, no, you want to bring the bone together to the the periosteum and cortices are united so they can heal. So the ACL that's left in space, um, looking at its opposite fellow, everyone we believe after 21 days, the ACL gives up and it just says, I've had enough, I'm closing over and it caps over or involutes. And it's sort of like a flower, like a lotus flower closing at night but it varies. So the biology of this is different. So we've seen involution as early as day seven. Um, so some, some patients come in already involuted at day seven, whether the on ACL, I'm sorry, on the MRI, it's capped over. Um, but we've healed people up to day 19. So, so that's very, the, yeah. that's, that's yeah. the latest that you've seen. That's the latest we've healed is day 19. And that patient was very lucky. Yeah, and we've we've healed others at day eighteen, day seventeen, but I had a patient come in yesterday who was day seventeen, um, and this patient had an MRI done at day ten that showed she was a very good candidate for the treatment, but because there was a delay to day seventeen, I asked um, her parents that we get another MRI because I just don't want to put her through this challenging and very inconvenient treatment of being non weight bearing on crutches. And going on anticoagulants, etc., um, without without knowing that she was a good candidate, and you know she'd involuted in the seven days, and the the window was lost. So mm. we didn't offer her. I didn't offer her the treatment, and she's going for an ACL reconstruction. Yeah, but she was, she was a great candidate ten day, seven days ago. So that that adds the new the the narrative, the discussion that. It's a semi-urgent injury, the ACL, um, particularly for children who carry a burden of, um, you know, possible morbidity or suffering longest, the, longer than a 40-year-old who, who ruptures their ACL, you know, an 11-year-old. And we've got two patients in the protocol, a boy and a girl who are nine, and our oldest patients are 65 female, 63 male. So that's the spectrum of age. Um, you know, the the child that ruptures their ACL 
and ends up in an emerg very busy emergency apartment, as you said, gets a Zimmer splint put on, there's your, go and get an MRI, but there's no rush to get an MRI and it's hard to get an MRI and they, it might take two weeks to get the MRI and then they might get the report five days later and then the horse is bolted and the window is closed. And an imminently healable ACL has now um, undergone a non-union where the ACLs involuted and you, we see them on and follow up on these MRIs that they it's it's a tragedy because it's the ACL stumps are looking at each other in shooting distance, you know, in that four to six millimeter mm -hmm. range. Um, and that when conversely we the, the ACL might be profoundly injured with you know involuted stumps 1.5 centimeters apart that never could have healed. Um, but involution is your enemy. And you, you need to get the diagnosis quickly, um, clinically, radiologically with an MRI, have that shared decision talking about, it was really, there's non-surgical options, which are rehab alone, bracing the need to facilitate healing. And then surgical, which is ACL repair with an ACL repair surgeon and ACL reconstructive surgery. They're the two surgical, um, but it, you've got to be quick, get off the mark, getting the diagnosis so the patient has a choice of the this new treatment otherwise you've lost the window after definitely after three weeks yeah post covid a lot of people in australia are heading back overseas to ski and with that obviously more people are most likely doing their acl as we've discussed before catching edge something like that so these next questions are based on an example of someone rupturing their acl while skiing in japan or somewhere overseas and then they want to fly back to australia for treatment now, we've discussed already the anticoagulants, so let's just dive through this because I think this is very important for people to understand. So if the cross-bracing protocol is indicated post-ACL rupture, should you wait until day five post-injury to use anticoagulants such as Arelto to reduce the risk of DVT? The answer is yes. Um, Why? Well, to, and I saw this in January, February this year when you know COVID was finally over and people could could travel and ski overseas um you know they unfortunately have an injury skiing and it's, and it's usually it can be low to medium energy where they just catch an edge and fall off a chairlift and they get their court skis caught up if they're a beginner or they could be an elite skier that's skiing in 90k an hour and jumps five meters in the air it's a high energy skiing injury they end up down in the clinic at, at the ski resort um and then they often fly home to Australia and then may not get their MRI done until they turn up here in the stadium clinic or, or the clinics over Australia. Um, you really have to look after that patient who's got an injured knee um, and is flying internationally that they don't get a DVT um, and pull me embolus and God forbid die. So that it's very serious. Um, any injury if they've got a fracture um if they're lower limb injury so they're immobilized and they could get a um, stasis of the blood in, <clears throat> in their veins and a dvt so i would i would tell that injured patient to stay in japan or uh, canada usa europe for at least five days um after their skiing injury and get 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 physio from expert physios I do what we talked about, 30 to 90 non-weight bearing crutches. Um, and then day five, when the ACL has stopped bleeding, then start an anticoagulant and then enact all your DVT risk, risk mitigation strategies that you would have already started, such as compression garments, foot and ankle calf pump exercises, elevating, uh, try to get a bulkhead seat when you fly home so you've got room in front of you, or, or if, if you're lucky, business class upgrade. Um, but you, I would like the patient to be on an anticoagulant, uh, such as you know rivaroxaban, which is Xarelto or Ipixaban, or or at least aspirin. Um, I know that's an anti-anti-inflammatory, but the good outweighs the bad here. You're trying to stop a DVT. It's interesting in the first 300 patients we, that we braced, you know, we had very expert advice from vascular physicians and vascular surgeons and hematologists about making this treatment safe 
um, by doing a Doppler on everyone before we put a brace on and doing a clinical examination for a DVT, um, taking a family history of, of hypercoagulable diseases, you know, factor five latent deficiency, et cetera. Um, and we only um, spotted six DVTs that came into the clinic from a ruptured ACL and all of them were after international flights um, or long car trips. So they rupture in Threadbow and then drive all the way back to Sydney. And by the time they get to Sydney, but it was fascinating. And this could be another finding with the research is no one who ruptured their ACL in their home city or town um, had a DVT on Doppler. Mm -hmm. So it was the international flight or the long car trip. So we now have changed that we don't Doppler everyone, only the, those higher risk or they've had a DVT before, or they've got a family history or they've got clinical signs. So we, mm. we always examine the calf and, and do Homan's test for a DVT. And then we'll Doppler those people because we don't want to hurt anyone and cause a DVT. Um, so that the, the injured skier um, ideally should leave and get on the plane minimum five days after enacting all your DVT risk mitigation. I would start them on an anticoagulant before they get on the plane. And then when they land in Sydney or whatever city they're in in the world, um, then have their MRI get classified and try. And if they're a good candidate, go to, go to 90 on day seven, day eight. Yeah. Beautifully answered. I'm glad we got that point across because I was fascinated when we were talking about that the other day on the phone. Um, it's really important point to get across. Right, now, thanks for bringing it up. The cross bracing protocol, obviously we're locked in that 90 degree position and it doesn't sound like it's a lot of fun for a lot of people. And I am on the cross bracing protocol pioneers Facebook page now. And it is fascinating what people come up with. They're very clever with some of the little inventions they've come up with to get through that 12 week period, especially the first four weeks in that locked 90 degree position. Have you got any tips for people that say are doing the cross bracing protocol and they're having any struggles with it? They're uncomfortable. How to get through it? Well, um, what I would say firstly is I want to thank the patients who have done this treatment. Um, and it's 369 now, um, particularly the first 80, uh, the, the subject of this recent publication, they are incredibly pioneering that they, would adopt an unpublished treatment um, and you know, trust me and the other doctors who have enacted it in Australia and New Zealand um, and go on this journey. Um, and, you know, it, it is quite crazy. Like you bend your knee to 90 in a brace and go non-weight bearing for four weeks. And that's all the time. You can't take it off. Well, you can take the brace off, but you've got to maintain the reduction of 90. For the medical and physio and allied health people listening it's like a mallet finger. You can't, you know, if you if you injure your extensor tendon mechanism of your finger and you want to hold it in fixation, you can't lose that reduction. Otherwise, the healing's undone. Um, same with you know an Achilles tendon that's treated uh, in equinus for reducing the ruptured tissue of the Achilles rupture. It's the same thing, uh, or a fracture. You can't take your plaster off and uh, in the first few weeks and move the fracture or the healing's undone. So you've got to maintain that 90 degrees for four weeks. And we think that's the most important part of this whole treatment is the reduction and immobilization that and the healing that occurs in the first four weeks. And then you, everything after that is remodeling of the healed um, ACL. And hopefully, as I said earlier, we've got a spectrum of healing all the way to full healing. Um, it's challenging and the, 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 that Facebook page and group, uh, you know, it's wonderful. These, these amazing uh, women and men and boys and girls who have done this treatment and they support it, support each other. They do it tough mentally as well as physically. Mm. Um, the, there's been an evolution of the, of the physiotherapy treatment of what we, how much exercise we do. And so I think, I think the, the people who, the first 80 would um, 
had quite a different experience to the last 80. We're doing, we're, we're much more, um, for want of a better word, comfortable with the um, how, how much exercise and forces we can put through the injured knee in terms of, you know, wall squats, calf raises, co-contractions, uh, et cetera. Um, but it's hard um, and they need, they need support from their family and friends. Uh, and that's raises a, you know, one of the relative contraindications or reasons not to do this treatment is if you're isolated, you know, you, you live alone, got a lot of stairs, uh, it's your right knee and you can't drive. Mm. You've got young children you to look after or a job that is a physical job and you're not going to get paid. It may not be the treatment for you. Um, this, um, the, the, the degree of, <clears throat> um, you know, inconvenience that to, to go non weight bearing on crutches um and y- your foot hits the ground walking again by week eight so the first seven or eight weeks you're non weight bearing mm. <clears throat> but um we've got a lot of mobility aids that patients can use that and have fun with so the there's a you can use an eye scooter yeah uh, some people get an eye walker so it's like a prosthesis that allows yep. them to walk We've had photographers and chefs who have got the eye walker and so their hands are free. Um, and some people get used wheelchairs, um, you know, quad bikes, all types of mobility aids to help them get around. Um, but we really encourage the eye scooter. That's it's the ease of, <clears throat> you know, going going um, out and about with their friends um, for long, long distances and not getting tired with the crutches. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but you definitely want to thank the patients who this study would not have happened without. <clears throat> They've all been exceptional. And I think it, it attracts quite exceptional people to do a, a novel treatment to take it on. I think it's, it's something in their personality that is uh, curious and courageous. Mm. So, um, I thank them very much. We've had you know, spectacular triumphs in the last four years, but equally we've had spectacular failures, um, especially in the first one to two years before we developed the MRI classification system and that spectrum of injury and spectrum of healing that we're going to achieve. Yeah. Um, and I think the, the, the no one's been um, upset and um, they've been upset, but the, the, they've, they've all been understanding that they, they went into it eyes wide open and, um, and they've contributed enormously one of my mates from school went through the protocol last year and we were at our 15 year reunion and he was on crutches at the time locked at 90 degrees and at the time he was hating it but after he had a great healing response he was so thankful that he had done it now when i was looking on the pioneers facebook page this was hilarious some of the inventions that some of the patients have come up with is brilliant so with the scooter there was one photo on there where what they've done they've put a wall broom holder that they've got from bunnings on the front of their scooter so they can clip their crutches in like onto their scooter and then Mm. each end of the crutch is sitting inside a stubby holder it's hilarious and then they've got sort of I think they've got cable ties at the bottom to hold it all down and so when they go out and about they can use the scooter but also the crutches yeah. Um, and some of the other little tips were like washing the brace so it doesn't smell, shower chair. Um, there were so many great nuggets of advice yeah. for people on there, like working from home, even getting a cleaner, um, a European size pillow for sleeping and lounging around. Um, there was just so many great little tips. So um, if anyone does go down this path of going into the cross bracing protocol, I highly recommend you jump on there because I think the, as you know, Tom, the patients often give you little ideas and I constantly get this from people. They, they come up with some great ideas for not only rehab, but also just how to get through a protocol like this. Yeah. It, you always got to stay open. Like, um, the, the, and patients teach you whether we're talking about ACL injury and this new cross bracing protocol or any other area of medicine and physiotherapy, stay open, listen to your patient. Um, they, they, these patients come from a wide variety of backgrounds, you know, with highly intelligent um, engineers who've done the treatment, um, who come up with 
what you're talking about physiotherapists we've had nine physios do the treatment and the patient yeah. you're talking about is bron um who who came up with that idea that you of the crutches at the front with the yeah. and he also had a stubby holder for drinks and coffee yeah um and then a jane came up her husband who's engine who's an engineer came up with a device to strap the crutches to her back so mm. like a backpack so yeah she's on her ice scooter with her backpack so that community is 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 extraordinary how they all support each other and um and they talk to our physios and one of the physios errol errol lim here in sydney it was very innovative in um you know improving the bracing experience with it in the first four weeks of um some ideas he shared with our stadium physio team and so and the, on the point of those nine physios that have done the treatment um, they've been fabulous giving ideas to the other physios looking after them. Mm. They all say that the first six to seven weeks are hard and they are, but then it's quite easy. Um, yeah. The last five weeks and in the last three weeks, you sleep without the brace to so weeks, 10, 11, 12. So what I say to patients who are taking on this treatment is I say, look, you just think of it like you've broken your leg. You've got a fractured tibia. You'd have to go non-weight bearing on crutches. Um, you've got a fractured ACL. We're, we're going to put it in a better position to heal by bending the knee. And unfortunately, we have to hold it there for four weeks in that position and you need to be non-weight bearing on crutches. Um, you can take the brace off if you're in a safe environment. You know, Say you're sitting on the couch, you put your foot right up against the end of the couch so you know you're not going to straighten your leg out. You can take your brace off, massage your leg, put some moisturizer on your skin, have a bit of brace free time. Um, but you've got to main maintain that 90 degrees. Um, so yeah, in a nutshell, I'd urge anyone who adopts this treatment to, to get on this for the moment, this Facebook group and um, read, to, it, you don't even have to participate. You can just mm. read the feed and learn, get lots of tips. You can seriously, it, within five minutes, you'll learn so much because it's such yeah. an emotional roller coaster, and all these people are just like some of the posts that people are doing, they're, they're like an essay of all these dot points of how to get through it, you know, accept help. I've got a couple here that I've copied and you can do everything yourself. You can't do everything yourself anymore. Accept help. Let the frustrations out. Don't dwell on it. Remember the small wins. Don't try and walk too far in one go. You always have to get back to where you left do groceries online, pay for a cleaner. You know, there's all these yeah, little some, things. Some fabulous you know, um, entries by some great men and women and boys and girls that, are, that want to help. They're benevolent. They want to help the others get through yep. it. And um, yep. yeah, one, one, one area of that Facebook group that is, is upsetting is that some people get better heels than others. And mm. Indeed, there's going to, I'm not minority now that we've got the class, the MRI ability to diagnose the spectrum of injury. Some people don't get very good healing at all. So that's upsetting you know, that that you see some people celebrating and others don't get as good a result. Um, so that's, but we always warn the patients and their families about, about that. So that they're, they're ready for the, any, any possible outcome. When it comes to the brace, what brace do you typically recommend someone use? Because there was a couple of people that were recommending different braces on the community. Yeah. So look, any brace will work. Um, so you just got to, the brace has to maintain the 90 degrees. Um, so you arguably want a brace that's that's comfortable, doesn't irritate their skin. Um, in the winter time, a lot of the women wear uh, ath you know, athletic garments, you know, mm under their brace to protect their skin. So, and that also acts as compression. Um, you don't want a brace that migrates up and down the leg. Um, so and it depends how much money the, the patient would like to spend. Um, but in, in the first 80 patients, we, uh, we used um, an Osseur brace um, and some, some used Donjoy. Um, and then we, we did a lot of market research about getting, you know, the best experience for the patient and also um, being accurate with the brace at 90, um, stopping the migration up and down the leg, et cetera. And we landed on a, the Boa fine brace, which is um, 
uh, was a, is designed for patients wanting to ski and to play sport mm. with ACL deficiency. Uh, and then we modified it to, get, to enable it to be bent at 90 and 60 degrees. So the Balfine made extra blocks so we could secure it at 90. It's the Secutech Genu? Yeah, it's Secutech called a Secutech Genu. Genu. Yeah. Um, to, it's more expensive than the other braces. Um, mm. And it's not everyone's cup of tea, but, um, and like I said, there's paper, people right at the moment navigating the braces in all types of braces. Um, but um, the majority would be using the Secutech Genu. Yeah, the majority of people mention that on the on the community on Facebook, definitely. Yeah. Now, Once what again, happens? Want to encourage compliance and yep. to and make it not too to um you know terrible experience for the patient. Yeah, for sure. Their skin and discomfort, etc. Now, what happens with those people that have a poor healing response post the cross bracing protocol? I assume they go down the surgical route. Yeah. Um, so that brings up the point of how we came up with the MRI classification system, which was you know, February, 2021. Um, and then patient 38, uh, Oliver, who's a lovely young guy with equally lovely family and parents who took on the treatment, um, knowing that it was novel. Um, and he, he's a very elite athlete. Um, he could play all codes of football, league, union, soccer, uh, and every team wanted him and every club wanted him because um, um, he's so elite. Um, and he he didn't get a good healing outcome. Um, so he uh, he had reduced thickness that was taut, or t so re reduced thickness of the ACL that was tight. So he examined well at 12 weeks. And then by six months, he, he, he was quite, elongated so he was reduced thickness sag we call it in our classification so it was like like a suspension bridge rather than a straight draw bridge of the acl it's suspended going through the notch uh, on the acl oas radiological score that's a two score two for the doctors and physios listening um and then it was it was devastating because i'm i was in, here in the clinic in this room with Oliver and his parents. And it was a Friday afternoon, I think 6 p.m. And we had to deliver the news that it hadn't worked. Um, and he, the family were uh, extraordinary uh, on the way they took the news and Oliver. Um, and then we had to talk about ACL reconstructive surgery and crossing him over. Um, and I went home that weekend and I looked at his MRI, the, the initial, the 12 week and the six month and I must have looked at it you know, 50 times trying to work out what was it about that MRI that was different to the ones that healed. And then we, I went back over the previous 30, 37 and looked for the, the good or excellent healers, anatomical healers, um, the non-anatomic where it's it's healed, but it's might be a bit thinned or it might be elongated or indeed the complete um poor outcomes, healing, where it heals to the lateral wall, heals to the PCL, or no healing. And that's when I saw this concept of displaced tissue out of the notch, um, large gap distances between the, the, the ACL tissues that may not be reducible. Um, and obviously working very closely with the three radiologists in the um, to develop this MRI classification system, you know, Rowan Sabara, Phil Lucas, Andrew Vanderheever, um, who, who, like this whole research is a team effort with all the co-authors that, that are on that paper. Um, and we, the three radiologists and I, and my nephew, Matt Dowsett, who's also a co-author and also patient five, we we worked incredibly hard on this MRI classification system that, that's been evolved over the last three to four years. Um, so we now that we've got it in you know four years down the track, we can predict we feel that that the patient may have a poor outcome. Um, and you're having that conversation when you're bracing them. Uh, and people are still taking on this treatment knowing they've got a severely injured ACL. and i've tr I've sometimes tried to talk them well, I have tried to talk them out of it. and they say, Tom, I just want to brace anyway because i've I've got no health insurance. 
I don't want to have surgery. I, I want to use surgery as my second option. Uh, let's do the brace and I'm willing to take the risk. You know, I might get a reduced thickness, tight heel that might might serve me um, and, and make my knee stable. But the ACL is reduced thickness. Um, so, and then some people cross over when they return to sport. Um, so, and, and their knee gives way when they return to sport. Um, and so of the... 369 patients, we've got 310 that are 12 weeks to nine years follow-up. And we've got 34 that have crossed over to surgery, um, which is roughly, you know, 10 to 15%. Yep. Um, and it's interesting in that 34, there's only six that had beautifully healed, anatomically healed ACLs. Uh, and the other... Um, you know, 28 had either no healing, which is not many. We only 6% get no healing in this, in this treatment. They get um, less optimal healing. So there's something going from femoral origin to tibial insertion, but it's either thinned at certain areas uh, or elongated, or rarely it heals to the lateral wall or PCL or both. Um, and then they we cross them over either at the 12 week mark when we recognize it or they return to, to sport and then he gives way um no one's had a profoundly damaging giving way episode um, where they've really hurt their knee on subsequent instability thankfully because we we i myself and largely Ra jury the other doctor in who i thank dearly in new zealand we keep a very close eye on the patients all the way returning them to sport so we've got very good follow-up. We know about every patient. Um, so they're either crossed over in the minority at the 12 week mark or on their returning to sport. Once again, 34 out of 310 that are, at, that are at 12 weeks to nine years. Yeah. During the conversation, we've already had a few patient population examples that you've used. With that in mind, is there a difference between males and females if they are, say, a 35-year-old weekend warrior, how you would go about um, bracing even the anticoagulants? Uh, is there anything to keep in mind because women and men are obviously different? Women have a menstrual cycle. Are there mm. any changes? Sure. So the for women um, in the initial consultation, um, I always, uh, like like men, I always ask about previous DVT. Um and are they on the oral contraceptive pill, which can elevate their risk of DVT? And I also also ask about do they have heavy periods, because if you're on an anticoagulant, your menstrual period will be heavier. Um, you'll bleed more, unfortunately. Um, of all the women who have done the protocol, only one had to abandon the protocol because her period got so heavy. Um, and but she got three weeks at ninety in the bank before we basically brought the knee out. And stop the anticoagulant. Um, and you know, it's interesting that what you can learn from these people or outliers on where where the compliance was abandoned. Uh, she healed anyway. Um, so maybe the three weeks at 90 was enough. Um, but we still have pushed on with the four weeks at 90 cross bracing protocol. Um so always ask about periods. Are they heavy? Are they on the pill? If they're on the pill, we ideally like them to stop the pill. Um, they could be on it for medical reasons or contraception. Um, they can use other other form of contraception just for the eight weeks that you could you, that you're on the uh, Xarelto or the anticoagulant. Um, so you, and then if they have very heavy periods, um, they can take an iron supplement or iron rich foods. As I said, only one patient in the whole series had to abandon because of the periods were so heavy. Um, other differences are, um, you know, that, that some women have patellofemoral uh, chondral change. So they have osteoarthritis in their patellofemoral joint, a little bit more than men because of their valgus alignment. Um, and that that's a relative reason not to do the treatment. They, they might get more anterior knee pain. They may not, may not be able to do their, you know, the, the knee at 90 for four weeks, uh, as well as someone without patellofemoral 
um, degenerative changes. So that's that's definitely something to look for as a doctor and physio is does the patient already have anterior knee pain? Do they have patellofemoral uh, degenerative changes, chondromalacia? Uh, and that's a that patient will have to be managed differently through the bracing protocol. Um, and arguably, if they can't do the rehab as well, they may not heal their ACL as well in terms of remodeling it in those you know five weeks to twelve weeks when they're doing their rehab. So. Um, yeah, so ask, ask about periods, ask about the pill and ask about patellofemoral pain. With that patient in mind that did do the 90 degree locked position for three weeks with that in mind, the protocol changes going forward. Do you think there will be protocol changes as in you will, will be locked for a shorter duration, the whole 12 week period, will it be shortened? Do you think um, the change, there'll be any changes in terms of the degree of flexion as well? Yeah, great question. Uh, the answer is yes. I, I think we came up with this idea, you know, Merv and I nine years ago, or Merv's idea, and I was lucky enough to be able to enact it in clinical practice. And then I gathered a, a, a great team around me of the, the co-authors and, um, I couldn't have done this research without my reception team here at the stadium clinic. Couldn't have done it without the PRP radiology reception team and radi radiographers running the MRIs, the radiologists, and, and also stadium physio and, and all the doctors and physios who have, um, including yourself, who have um, been part of this, this new treatment here in Australia and New Zealand. So, what we've learned in this four year journey in particular, since, you know, Toby patient six triggered the research is what we've learned is some people say, look, I just can't do this 12 weeks. I, I can't do four weeks at 90. Um, could I, for one of, one of a better word, take a downgrade and do three weeks at 90 or two weeks at 90. Cause I've got to go back to work. I'm a laborer um, or I'm a, I'm a physiotherapist and I, I need to, look after my patients so we have a compromise and we say look can you get two weeks in the bank and then we'll start bringing you out uh, so you, you, you're achieving the reduction for less time hoping that you're going to get enough healing in the two weeks or the three weeks so what's evolved in the last couple of years is we now offer a six-week cross bracing protocol which is called a modified and an eight week um, obviously that corrupts the science so for the scientists listening, and they've got these different protocols happening. And but as clinicians, we're trying to look after the patient, and every patient counts. And I, you know, I don't care if we lose a number out of the you know twelve week cross bracing protocol series. If someone wants to choose six weeks or eight weeks, which is two yeah. weeks or three weeks at ninety, um, and they've by and large done very well. So. Um, we we often choose it now for the combined MCL ACL, so that profoundly ruptured you know, grade three medial ligament and ACL, uh, or or indeed a postlateral corner injury that's not too badly displaced. I would not brace them at four weeks at ninety because they'll get too stiff. Um, so I'll I'll do a, probably a six week, the two weeks at ninety, or three week at ninety, yeah. fearing that they're going to be too stiff coming out of the brace. Um, on that topic, a lot of the um, criticism of this treatment is that the patient will be too stiff or get arthrofibrosis of the knee. We've, we've had it in a small minority and it's always reversible with physio strategies. No one's had a permanent fixed flexion deformity um, or stiff knee, um, but some patients have had you know three or four months out on the other side of bracing to get their knee out straight, but it's, it's a small minority. So I think there will be... Uh, bespoke bracing protocols for for that particular patient so it'll be on patient factors of of choosing um how long a protocol they want to do and i think there'll be mri factors and with the advancement of mri and we're working with sydney university of trying to get 3d mri uh, and really good resolution of measuring the gap distance and measuring the percentage of ACL tissue 
displaced out of the notch. Uh, and is involution happening? Is the is the epi ligament, for one of a better word, dying or giving up? Um, and all those get fed into a decision that you mm. talk to the patient about. And you know, in the future, if you've got a you know a gap distance of two millimeters, and you're here in the clinic day seven, and you know you're not involuting because you're day seven, um, you may only need to go to 60 degrees to reduce that gap distance. Um, you don't need to do the 90 because it's because you you're sort of over treating the the reduction. So I think yeah, but we're not ready to, to go into that yet because we just we really want them to heal. Um, and so we go to 90. But I think in the future there'll be artificial intelligence and deep learning. You know, the each patient's acute MRI will be fed into a database. There's only a certain number of different ways the ACL gets injured. Mm. And the database at the moment is the doctors who have looked after the patients, um, the radiologists who have looked at the MRIs, and the, they see what the what the ACL injury looks like and how it heals. But the computers can do that in the future. God bless the doctors and radiologists. But wouldn't it be great if... if it, it's made sort of, you know, that KISS principle, keep it simple, stupid, that all of us can can classify, you know, when that skier or soccer player and, and she comes into the clinic, you can put the MRI up, see it in 3D, um, see where the ACL is injured and what's the gap distance, what percentage tissues partially avulsed out of the femoral origin or landed out of the notch. And then you can say, well, based on, you know, thousands of patients who had that type of ACL injury, if you do that type of bracing protocol, or um, then you'll get this result of healing. Um, or that's too badly injured and you, you're you never going to reduce that ACL injury. You need a surgeon. Uh, if you're an, a young athlete and you really want to go to you know, high demand ACL sport, and then you select, you know, the, the, these elite orthopedic knee surgeons who can either repair that injury um, or reconstruct it uh, and give the patient a stable knee that they can return confidently to sport without getting hurt. We're probably out of time, Tom. I think you've got patients to attend to. It's 9.30, so we better get rolling. Do you have any last words, words of wisdom, anything you want to get across to the general public, doctors, physios out there? Well, Firstly, thank you for your, your time and for giving me this opportunity. Thank you to the patients who have done it, this treatment, um, and their families. Um, they're all amazing. Um, thank the co-authors. Um, thank my reception here at the stadium clinic um, and all the physios and doctors who have helped me and um, particularly here in this clinic and all around Sydney, Australia, New Zealand. Um, the messages I want to get across are um, this is a novel treatment. It's the, there's more research to come. Like this is paper one is, has got a lot of scientific or methodological flaws. Um, so the pure scientists and doctors reading it will say, well, you know, that what we've talked about, the, um, the lack of, um, it's probably at best level three or four evidence. It's a case series in private practice, but the, 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 the science is compelling and the patients if you are also compelling that this does work for some ACLs. I would estimate 40 to 50% of ACLs across the spectrum. Uh, and then the other big message is we need surgeons still. Um, they're very important. Um, and we're all a team and we all want to look after the patient. The, the patient's the most important person and we just give them all the information and then they make a decision on what they want to do, whether it's rehab alone, cross bracing protocol or some form of bracing. And then the surgical options. Um, the ACL can heal contrary to what I was taught and what has been popularized and for decades now. Um, the only tissue in the body that doesn't heal is the enamel of teeth, which is fascinating. But every other tissue has got healing capability of varying degrees. The ACL is injured in a spectrum like all eight orthopedic injuries. And it will heal in a spectrum if you do rehab alone, 
but you'll get much better healing if you bend the knee into flexion and, and put a brace on to once again, close reduction immobilization of the injured tissue. Um, I think the, there's much more research to come and, then more, and there's we don't know it all yet. And we there's lots of you know, fascinating discoveries to come. Um, and you know, I, hopefully this research will trigger you know, fires all around Australia, New Zealand, the world of um, pioneering doctors, physios, scientists, patients who will explore this, this notion of bracing the knee, um, of triaging the patient based on the patient factors and the MRI factors into, well, here are your options. Um, what would you like to do? Um, and the other very important take-home message is that um, it, it is a treatment that also has uh, risks. So, um, and that those risks need to be discussed and those risks need to be mitigated. So, um, you know, I'm very close to physiotherapists. Um, you know, they've got so many friends and colleagues of mine are physios, but the physio can't do this treatment on their own. Um, so you can't take someone to 90 and put a brace on without um, having a doctor involved to write a prescription for, say, the anticoagulant to mitigate the risk of DVT. So it could be a dangerous treatment if it's done um, without medical care. So you need a doctor or a clinician, a clinician to do this treatment. You need um, a physiotherapist that loves ACLs and knee rehab. And you need a radiologist and a great MRI uh, team, you know, radiographer, et cetera. Um, so that's the trio you need. You need doctor, physio, radiologist, and then you're on your way. And those little pods can develop. Um, so you need to classify, you need to mitigate the risk of DVT. The risks are poor healing, the DVT, stiff knee and muscle atrophy. And you tell the patient about all of them and you mitigate all of them as best you can. So um, that'd, be, that'd be the main last message is it doesn't come without risk and everyone needs to be aware of it and mitigating it together. And um, I'm hopeful that um, that those little teams will pop up in every city, potentially around the world, um, so that patients have access. Um, it also, the, in the developing world, so there's lots of patients who don't have access to MRI and ACL surgery on this planet, you know, in all parts of the world. Um, so what's motivated me the most in the last four years is um, you know, not the elite athletes, and I love them to death. I love being a team doctor, but they're going to be the last adopters of this treatment. They want to see lots of data, and so do their, their medical teams and physio teams and coaches and player managers, et cetera. It's the poorer countries that don't have access to surgery and the children that uh, have motivated, motivated me to the last four years to drive this research. And so I, I can see a time not, not too far down the track that the child's managed differently in the A&E &E, um, like we've talked about and that access to bracing is in um, our nearby countries like Fiji and Polynesia, et cetera, that may not have an MRI, may not have a surgeon or Africa, Asia, South America. And that young female athlete that's a talented 16 year old who ruptures her ACL. She just needs a, a clinic nurse and physio to prescribe the anticoagulation uh, safely and the knee brace and they're away. And 40 to 50% of ACLs in those countries will heal um, rather than being five to 10% heal spontaneously uh, and 90% ACL deficient. So I think that's really exciting. Thank you so much for your time, Tom. You are a true pioneer and the medical fraternity out there, we all thank you for what you've done because I see this going further and further. And even just the process yesterday of when my young footballer had gone down, the process of calling the stadium clinic Moore Park where you're based and getting him in within 
what was it, probably 16 hours from injury is just phenomenal. So thank you for everything that you're doing because it's changed my practice and it's helping hundreds of people and it's going to help thousands of people going forward. So thank you. Pleasure. And it could not have done it alone. <clears throat> so I don't thank everyone and um, I appreciate once again your time. No worries. My pleasure, Tom. We're going to do 2.0, 3.0, 4.0 of this podcast, no cool. doubt. We're going to do regular cool. updates, no doubt. Definitely. It sounds great. Thanks, yeah, Andrew. Looking, looking forward to it. And I'll probably see in about three hours, I'm going to come to okay. that consult with um, oh, the patient, the patient that hurt himself yesterday. So Good on you, I'll see you, I'll see you, you very mate. soon. Thanks again. And if anyone wants to reach out to Tom, he's based at the Stadium Clinic, Moore Park, here in Sydney, um, jump on his website. And if you've got any other questions, just reach out to me and as usual, stay strong.